right, so yeah, what we are here to do today at the second talk of the Game UX Summit is Warframe, real world lessons from five years of community-driven user experience. So that's the, the story we're telling today, and I'm telling the community half of it. I'm so excited to do that because our community's been with us and really helping us with this game. And I am Rebecca Ford, the live operations and community producer at Digital Extremes. And I'm Dorian Stewart. I'm the studio UI lead, as Rebecca mentioned, for a wonderful studio named Digital Extremes. Yes, so Digital Extremes, if you don't know, this is like a quick history. It was founded in 1993 by James Schmaltz, who is watching me, so I'll try not to embarrass him or myself, but uh, it's a game that's had over 20 years of development history, and the story we're telling today is the past five years of Digital Extremes. It's Warframe. Yeah, so we're actually, we're headquartered in London. Not the accent you expected, eh? That's actually because we're from London, Ontario. <laughs> Which, hold on, hold on. Don't laugh, don't it's laugh. It's no laughing matter. It's generally regarded as the second best London in the world. <laughs> and I think we've, um, we've rehearsed this part to try and point to where London actually is from here, but now that we're on the stage, we've lost our yeah, orientation. I can't see the sun, so, so as far as we're concerned, it's two hours in a direction that might be that way. Oh, that way. There, thank you. Thank you. It's that way. So in addition to our London uh, studio, we're actually very excited to announce that we are opening a studio in this beautiful city. And in addition to that... Yay. We also have a West Coast office in California. Yeah, we've never had more yeah. offices, so yeah. you're, reaching, you're seeing us at peak office, so this is a... <laughs> and this expansion has really been all thanks to one thing. Yes, so we're gonna ask the same question from before. How many of you have heard of Warframe? I didn't oh, know what yes. the answer would be, so that's great. Uh, so maybe <laughs> I don't need to explain it too much, but if you don't know, uh, it's a free-to-play game. This is a free-to-play cooperative game as a service. We launched on the PC Steam Open Beta in March of 2013. We were a launch title on the PlayStation 4 uh, in September of 2013, and then we quickly jumped onto the Xbox One the following year in September. And this is sort of a game that started as Left for Dead in Space, and as Heather said, we're kind of going open world light. So how did we do that? What's our story? What do we think we've learned from that process is what we're going to talk to you about today. Yeah, so I'd love to start this with a bit of a, a difficult statement, perhaps. Is, um, so we've been around for five years. We've seen remarkable growth. Um, we don't have a UX designer. Oh, shit. Oh, my God. Audible <laughs> gasps from everyone in the audience. So why are we here, right? And how did, how did we achieve this? So, this growth that we've seen. So we think, we suppose, we present today that we have used the community as sort of a surrogate for user experience design because the nature of our game as a service title, the, the, what we had to do to get Warframe out there for the company, for our, our, you know, what we want to do, is kind of do it in partnership with our community. The people that have given us feedback, given us their time to make Warframe a five years and counting game that's now somehow adding open world light. So that, that's the story here today. But uh, of course, with all presentations, you probably want an agenda so you know the chapters. So we're gonna first, uh, in point one, look at essentially our business philosophy, our development philosophy, and how we arrived there thanks to some really helpful analytics. Next, we're gonna take a look at what we as developers can do in conjunction with the community team to really manage this real-time feedback. You know, Games as a Service is always running how can we manage this and how can we interact with the players in the best way possible to essentially have them drive the user experience. We're gonna look then at the solar map which is one of the you know, core features in our game, some mistakes that we've made with this feature and how we've been able to use the community to essentially rectify our ways and proceed forward in a positive direction. Rebecca's then gonna take you on a little ride talking about fair free to play, so that should be quite, quite exciting. And then we're going to look at what we have done to really leverage the cooperative user experience in our game. And finally, we're going to share with you what we have been doing and hopefully what you guys can take home to replicate the magic that we've encountered with Warframe. Yes. So without further ado. Yes, and this is the part of the presentation where we remind you, we're not business people, we just certainly have a reality that drives Warframe's five-year rapid update cycle. So yes. that's something that is Dorian's uh, place to talk about. So who here came for graphs to this conference? Okay, Some cool, hints. cool. Sweet. So I'm just going to sketch this out really roughly. <laughs> this is a graph of our daily users. You can see what I'm going to do next is I'm actually going to superimpose another very rough graph of our daily revenue. Now these look pretty closely linked, right? Now I'm actually, I'm gonna, I know that you guys, you know, you had a little bit of a hard time kind of shouting stuff out. Can anyone shout out to me what they think the correlation between uh, daily users and daily revenue is? Am I allowed to shout? You can shout if no, you want. No, it's okay, I know it. Any guesses? Sorry? 
know. It's 93%. It's well, well, not the right. There you go. <laughs> you, were, you were correct. You were correct. Yeah. <laughs> so that's really, really closely linked, right? So what we can do then is we can actually take this graph, and we're actually going to permit ourselves to combine them into a really magical thing that we refer to a lot as engagement. And this engagement is not only daily revenue and daily users. It represents reasons for players to come back to the game on a daily basis. It represents the social ties that bring them into the game. It represents really their investment as a player in the long term and in short term to come back to our game and play. And so it's, it's really, it's a kind of a, it's you know, nirvana essentially. It's, it's benefit for everyone. Um, and so we, we, we use this a lot to kind of, is our, is our main metric. Now what I'm gonna get you to do next is looking at this graph. Would you be able to, for example, point out where you think our major updates were? If you say something like this, you'd be absolutely correct. So marked by, by these emojis, these are updates and they're not just stuff to buy. And that's gonna be something that's gonna be very important as we continue forward. I mean, these, these are so much more yeah. than that. Yeah, I mean, no update is the same really in Warframe. The quality of life changes that our community want are just as impactful as something new. So every update is a balance or it's something completely unique to the quality, the change, a complete overhaul of our melee system. It could be anything. Exactly. And the thing that we're going to look at next is Rebecca kind of talked briefly about the importance of frequency of updating the game. And we're going to look at what happens when we fail to do that. So the graph goes down and down and engagement plummets and pretty soon we're hanging out with Dante in a very scary place. Um, and this really served as a, as a valuable lesson for us, you know, looking at this graph that spans many, many months that we cannot permit ourselves for the users to have this happen. We don't want their engagement going down. It's bad for everyone, as we mentioned before. And so, I mean, we've been really lucky in the sense that we, we, are, we were able to rebound from that. And we've essentially since then taken that as our mantra, our way of developing that we cannot permit ourselves to have that happen again. And we haven't and our updates have been continuing to drive that engagement. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of see in the graph, we started from nothing. And that is very true with Warframe. You know, this is a game that had no updates at first and, yeah. you know, no, no accounts made. So what does this philosophy look like numerically? Well, it looks like this. As Rebecca just said, we started from scratch. It was a very scary, very exciting time for us. Within year one, we had actually published 175 updates. And that's the key thing about the word update here is it's not just something new. It's something different. It's change. It's something the community's wanted. It's, it's just commitment to updating that live build. So to year two, we had up, gone up to 325 updates. At this point, we had reached just over 15 million accounts created. Year three, 475 updates, over 22 million accounts. And currently we're sitting at near, near five. And that's crazy, 670 updates. And we're at over 30 million accounts right now. So it really shows our commitment to that, essentially respecting the graph that we showed you earlier and that that is what the players are, want the most and what's gonna drive their investment, their engagement, their enjoyment especially. It's true. And I mean, that 670 number is a lot. And with that many deployments to the live build environment, people have opinions on what you're doing. They want to talk about it, they, they, and we invite them to have that conversation. So the next part is managing that real-time feedback. If you've updated your live build that many times, again, you bet people have something to say about it. So we have a little bit of a tool set. It's not, some, you've probably heard of all these tools, so I'll walk you through them clockwise from the top left. Uh, Reddit, of course, we're probably familiar with the uh, feedback you can get there and how that can change or allow you to make improvements to your game. Again, we're game as a service here. We're talking about a game that tries to iterate weekly with something. Uh, the forums are sort of our library of everything we've ever said officially on our own forums. It's all every patch note, every dev workshop. The panels are a live place for us to just talk to our player base and see what they're saying. If you're talking face to face, how does their opinion change? How does it improve? Or what, what can you garner from such an experience? Social media is its own, you know, its own thing. So I'm sure I don't need to explain Facebook, but uh, the middle one is the one that has a little bit of a story with it. This is our in-game chat system. By no means do, did we invent in-game chat, but we use it in a way uh, on the community side that really helps us to troubleshoot and enhance the in-game community experience. So, for example, if you are a Warframe player, so I know you know it, but maybe you don't play it, the word Arcwing, this is a game mode that isn't particularly popular with our players. So one week we were doing a sample, a word cloud, of everything that was being said in our public chat for that week, and we did not expect to see the word Arcwing there, but there it was. So we saw Arcwing and we said to ourselves, uh-oh, something's wrong, no one would be talking about it this much, and it turns out that there was a bug that was progression stopping 
happening that got people so frustrated they didn't go anywhere else to report it. So we had to use our in-game chat to isolate issues and we regularly do that just to see that the players are doing what we expect them to do and talk about. And the, the real value of the in-game chats, particularly a global chat, so this is essentially uh, everyone can go and talk in the same spot, it's, it's really the lowest friction area for players to share their experience with the game. So if you haven't implemented a global chat in your game yet, we would really highly recommend because we've seen huge dividends pay off from, from using it as the way that we have, essentially. Indeed, and the last one is Twitch. Uh, they've really been an up and comer over the past five years or so. And since 2013, we have been on Twitch streaming. What have we been streaming? Dev streams. This is when we sit down on a couch and have the devs show what they're working on real time to our community. This is the problem, like if you want opinions on your game, this is a way to do it. And this is a way that Dorian joined us on our 23rd dev stream, much less bearded, but uh, nonetheless, he was there to talk about UI. And we were presenting to our community a proposed change to the game. And yeah, that so this was a really interesting experience. Basically, when I arrived at DE, this is what our heads up display looked like. Um, and the, one of the first things that I wanted to do when I arrived there was really, you know, revisit this, modernize it both functionally and aesthetically. And so we had our opinions, we had our thoughts on what would make it better. We did at the start as you would on any product have, you know, go with your assumptions, use community feedback that already exists on the inner internet, and then also working with the community team getting a sense of what the players want. And so what we did is we actually brought to this first dev stream uh, this proposal of what it could look like just kind of based on that work behind the scenes. And it was a really interesting experience for us, especially if you are used to the kind of the box title model, where I, I'm sure some of you have done this, where you know, you're anticipating eagerly for the reviews to start coming, and you're kind of sitting behind your computer waiting for you know, these sites to kind of say what they think about the game. And even so, it's quite rare uh, for reviewers to even mention UI uh, in, in general. So it's quite interesting to kind of be sitting on this couch. And what we have is we actually have a setup where um, we're, we're giving our presentation on the stream, and there, we actually have a monitor with a Twitch chat that shows. And it's quite daunting if you're not used to that level of direct contact with your player base. You know, they're essentially going to be referring to you by name and saying, I hate what you're doing, I love what you're doing. And you have to have a thick skin to really adapt to that and kind of uh, continue going on with it and continually putting your work out there for the world to see and to judge and to critique. And with our dev streams, the feedback doesn't end at the Twitch setting. We That's go right. on to, you know, we have 30 million registered users. That's right. So this is our total register, uh, these are all our total registered users for the game. And just out of curiosity, how many of you, by show of hands, have purchased a game as a consumer in retail, played it, and then gone and commented on forums for that game? Can you raise your hands if you've done that? OK, so not, not a ton. I, I haven't myself. Um, but our number is actually quite staggering. What, what percentage of users so participate in the forums. What we see is 10% of our players actually come to our forums and their account is there. So they have made their way to the forums at some point and made an account, which means you have 3 million people that could potentially be giving their voice to the feedback loop we've invited them to. So after a dev stream, you know, <laughs> it doesn't just end when the, uh, when the camera turns off. It, it continues because you're essentially iterating live and then post and then you have to make it work and you have to ship something at some point. So what are those voices always, you know, yeah, so say. I mean, as you'd expect, as I said, people have love, people have hate. I'd love to give you an example of one, you know, negative one. This is by far not the worst yeah. that we've received, but, you know, I'll read it to you. The pillars of good UI design are shape and color. The proposed design uses neither. Please leave Swiss design the 1950s where it belongs. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and that's not the worst one. This is a work conference we brought, safer yes. work, so. There has been, yeah, much worse things. And again, going back to having a thick skin and kind of, it takes a long time coming from a, you know, AAA box title background to really adapt kind of taking this kind of uh, run force from, from players. And you know, in the, the thing in the air has the, the positive things are so positive, it makes you feel really good and gives you a lot of motivation to continue. But the most interesting thing in terms of our direction for the game is we'll get comments like this. Let's say half of the comments are like this for a certain feature. But then we'll actually get comments like this. I like it. It minimizes UI and maximizes play area, which is a good thing. Also, who hates clean and uncluttered? It's like hating IKEA, for God's sake. <laughs> right? So. The tricky thing for us, you know, as a UI team and as developers, is how do you reconcile both of those differing opinions, right? It's like, you know, what do you decide what to do next when you have people saying opposite things? And this is where I would encourage all of you to really leverage your community team as much as you can. Because they're going to be the people in the studio who have the tightest connection to the players. They have the best idea of the general sentiment uh, in terms of the player base, in terms of the temperature, what people are feeling, and they're going to be able to guide you towards the right direction. 
And so that's exactly what we did, Rebecca. I mean, we, we worked a lot closer, you and I, yes. with the community, reading all the comments that they had on our first iteration. We basically were able to take the HUD from something like this to what is now in game now today, which looks something like this. So this is taking into account all the feedback we got during the live streams, on the forums, the work that you guys did on the community side in terms of keeping us informed all the time. And that's really where the value of this, our collaboration today comes from, is that we have to work together to access the, the players and really make their UX what they expect it to be. Indeed. Yeah, so very exciting. So this has been here to, to this day. It's been changing. We've made improvements along the way. But it's really it stood the test of time in a, in a sense. So we're, we're very happy with it and can't thank the community enough for their time and their generosity and kind of help, helping us get there. Indeed. And there's been one, one section of the game's UI that has seen even more change. That's though. right. So that's the solar map. <laughs> yes. So if you don't play Warframe, solar map really quickly is the gateway to playing missions in Warframe. It is the, the, the solar system in front of you. You pick what planet. You pick what mission you want to do. So it is that gateway to actually engaging in the shooting gameplay, the, the power suits and everything. But uh, it's changed a lot. And we've made yeah. a lot of mistakes. So it started off like this. Rough, right? I can hear some of you laughing. I know. Here. <laughs> that was five years ago. It's fine. Um, honestly, the reason why we're showing this is because, honestly, we believe really deeply that it is totally acceptable, even encouraged to put rough content into the game. This rough. Yes. It's scary. People are going to rip you apart. Absolutely. But that's going to allow you to then, over time, develop and develop further. And it's, it's really difficult. It's, I'm not going to lie. It's, uh, it, but you have to do it because it does something that's so important in terms of your relationship with the user and it sets expectations that you're going to continually improve and that you're taking them along on a ride to collaborate with you and to co-create what they want the game to be. And so it's gone, it's gone through quite a few iterations. And players have stuck around with us through those. And they really feel like they have uh, a huge input. And, and they do. And we hugely value that. And what's interesting here is that we had actually just launched on PS4 at this point, um, which is a complete paradigm shift going from uh, you know, mouse navigation to a joystick navigation. And we were very frustrated with this solar map in particular. Um, lots of diagonal lines that are not the most easy to navigate with a controller. And so we said, OK, let's go back, start from the drawing board. We're going to do something that's awesome. And we came up with this. And we were so hyped internally. Maybe a little bit too much, and that's what we're going to look at next. Um, we didn't really, honestly, do our due diligence with presenting this community the way that we should, and we put it in game, and what happened? So with this particular iteration of the solar map, um, people liked it, a lot hated it, and no one really loved it. It posed problems of no real progression. How do I know what node leads to what? And it, it really created a, a bad experience, and the single gateway for people choosing what they're going to do, they didn't know what they were doing, and they didn't really know why they were doing it. So it was a big problem. So it took time for us to kind of, because again, we were so excited about this. We really thought that it was, it was going to be the be all end all and it was going to be fantastic. And so it took us time. It took us really seeing that community uh, user experience feedback that, you know, essentially thousands of tears later, as Kelsey in the crowd can attest to, thank you for all your work on this. <laughs> Thanks, Kelsey. Um, that we essentially arrived at something like this. And this is really, it's a, it's a throwback to the, to the segment system that we had before that the players had been clamoring for. And we've really seen engagement improve since we brought this back. It's true. We presented it on a dev stream, what I would like to say a little more properly, because we invited people early on in its process for the change. The background was actually originally white. And people didn't like that. And we found out pretty quickly. So we were able to rapidly iterate and then release something that you know, is really a throwback to that original linear map of progression and all these things that kind of guide people through all the planets. So the big lesson from this is, you know, you're going to make mistakes. Don't be afraid to take a completely different, different direction if you're not feeling that the community is liking it. And especially, don't be afraid to possibly go back to something that was working so well previously. And this is, it's, again, it's a very difficult thing to do uh, because you're basically, you know, you're, you have to put yourself into question a lot and kind of put, put your pride aside and uh, really focus on what the community drives you to do. It's so true. speaking of, yeah, speaking of the next thing, this is going to be a very exciting section, I think. He passes it over to me because this is where my non-UI artist art enters the presentation. So it's all, all on me if you, if you don't like that. But uh, this is the fair, free-to-play portion of the talk. It's really a lesson, only a handful of slides. And I think sometimes fair, free-to-play is a little bit of a paradox, an oxymoron. And we get that because we actually made mistakes early on, which I'm going to show you. Uh, this was very, very early Warframe in that beautiful red arrow. It's not Dorian's, it's mine. Uh, that is pointing to a gold-shaped item. Our community lovingly calls it a potato. And what that represents in Warframe's gameplay is you can purchase power. You can use money to become more powerful than your cooperative squad mate. Because again, we're talking cooperative gameplay here. And people hated that. Not only did the people that wouldn't spend money hate it, as you'd expect, the people that were 
buying it and supporting us said, I don't like this, it's unfair, I don't want to be more powerful than someone I'm playing my mission with. So what did we do? Well, we allowed you to build it. We um, put a system in that if you were you know, in the game, you could learn how to acquire these items if you're on at the right time. And over time, we've actually added more ways to earn these items to give you a free path. We put up long duration uh, events in game for you to get them. And that's been great. It's been, it's been a lesson for us to remember that this is actually the most important thing of all if you want free to play to really be taken seriously, I think. And we've continued that. That's a lesson we've added to one of the more controversial places, I suppose, which is the market. This is where you enter Warframe, it's free, you go to the market and ta-da, you can buy things in Warframe. But uh, we iterated on that, that uh, interface a lot. And what we did quite you know, relatively recently in the five years is we actually added a build tab to that marketplace. Again, that red arrow is pointing to it. And it's showing a player that may be about to make a purchase that they don't have to. They can build this. They can read the crafting requirements and come up with a plan to earn it as opposed to paying for it. And a player that does that is a huge, it, they're just wonderful for the community because they've learned something. They are now a source of information for a player who's engaged in Warframe but maybe can't afford it. They want to play it for free because you know, that's what they can do. And someone that knows how to do the free to play path to things can teach other players that. Yeah, and it's something that seems really counterintuitive, especially in a place like the market. It seems counterintuitive until you think back to the graph that we showed you at the very start where engagement is the most important thing, right? So the fact that people are, invest in the game. Everything else is positive in the world is going to happen as a result of that engagement. So it's not really about selling things, you know, dirtily or something. We want players to have a good time and everything good will come as a result of that and we take that very seriously. It's true and we propose that the Warframe user experience for a player is made up of these two things. That the immersive experience, of course, someone who's, you know, casting their powers with their Warframe, they're seeing someone dressed in gold looking really cool in the game. That's a pretty cool sci-fi experience but there's also the social, ex the social experience, pardon me. This is when someone knows how to build something in Warframe. This is when someone knows that DE four years ago said they were never gonna do something and they remember that and the, the community becomes involved in this sort of a live product that is this game as a service of Warframe. Yeah, so on to the next section we're gonna talk a little bit more about that is leveraging the cooperative user experience. And I'd love to, before passing this on to Rebecca, to kind of preface this with um, this notion that we had very early on that um, complexity is a death sentence. It's not the case, not what we found. Yes, it depends on where you place that complexity, it depends on where you put the learning curves, but there are actually lots of positives that come from integrating a bit of complexity into your game. Uh, for us, for example, players conquering difficulty in the right place begets a huge sense of ownership. It begets a sense of accomplishment from the user. And secondly, it actually, in terms of uh, you know, players socializing together, there's a positive on two fronts. First of all, there are the people who are helping others, whether they are hanging out in the global chat, whether they are curating uh, our Wikia page, which is actually one of, the, it's the, one of the biggest Wikia pages for games at the moment, and something we're actually very against at first, but we realize that, hey, we give these players a sense of ownership, we make them feel like they're really actively commuting to the community, and we're gonna see huge dividends from their engagement and their enjoyment, and especially passing that joy on to others. And that's the second part of it, is people who are being helped by these awesome community members they feel like they've entered a really warm and welcoming community and that's gonna make them feel really good about yeah, themselves. It's true, and like, in the same way that they teach other players things, they teach us a lot too about what are the strongest reasons for someone to play Warframe. Why do they stay? Why do they like it? And there's one system in our game that is an explicit social system, and that is the clan system. So this is a clan screenshot of uh, the Raw Steel clan. They're a very popular clan. They're a great group of people, and uh, they participate in this clan system. This is an area that you can kind of build a space tree fort. And uh, really, it's uh, the, the, what we see is the sooner you're in a clan, the better things are in Warframe for you. You stay longer, you play longer, you engage more. Great, so to finish things off, replicating the magic. So we're in a very fortunate position where we actually, we have a very exciting new title right, title right now called The Amazing Eternals. And this is a squad based, free to play first person shooter set in, as you can see, a really charming uh, pulp art style. Um, and we don't necessarily believe in formulizing in the sense that, you know, when you're dealing with such a long lifespan, you want to keep things different, you want to keep things having character, you want novelty. But there are a couple of things that we have repeated from our lessons on Warframe. And one of those is obviously our openness with the community. So we've actually had our first uh, dev stream already, but stuff like this where we'll essentially go onto the forums and do developer workshops. And what I'd like to precise with this is that this is not a process workshop. This is not showing the community, hey, we put this together. 
we're going to show you what we did, how we did it, et cetera. No. It's not also just a marketing thing. Yes, that's a part of it. We want players to get excited about what's coming next. But what this really is, is you can't see under the fold, but there is open conversation happening under there. And it's really, that's the most important thing to consider about that. Is that this is an invitation to the players to co-create the product that they will have ownership of in the future. All right, so we do need to wrap things up here yep. up on stage, but so we're quickly gonna wrap up sort of three things that we think are takeaways from this uh, presentation. The first is frequency over perfection. Uh, we really like to iterate our game a lot. 670 updates speaks to that. Uh, the second one is, uh, you know, we like to create citizens, not fans. I, we kind of don't call our players fans around the office because to us, they really have much more of a stake than that, our stakeholders are our community. And the last thing, of course, is yeah. nothing is ever final. Iteration is everything. I don't think we can say content is final in no. our game. This presentation, however, is. So thank you so much yes. for joining us. I don't know if we have time for questions, yeah. but thank you, everyone. I think we have time. We can do questions? OK, oh, yeah, so if anyone a couple questions, great. So if anyone has any, I think the mics have not moved, so that's good, because that means I can point, and it's true. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I'd love to know if you've ever been in a situation where you've designed a feature or a mechanic that maybe you know, worked well as a usability, uh, in terms of usability, but the community feedback wasn't great. Have you ever run into that, and how did you react? For usability in the sense that like it felt good to do, it was cool in the game? Yeah, it was simpler interactions, or maybe uh, visually something was easier to process. I mean, this isn't UI, but I feel like PvE versus PvP is a great example of that. Um, you know, I think that our PvE feature set is really fun to play, and some people really enjoy it, but um, the user experience of our game, their expectations, their expectations is a PvE game. Okay. Um, so I think that there was yeah. a, there's a, that, that would be my, my, my example that I could And think of. one other thing we did was we, this, the solar map, going back to that, we actually uh, put, they have resources on them and we put them in a different area that was, made the screen more clear and you actually had to hover to see what was there. So that still, that actually still creates a bit of controversy in the community. They kind of want it back to everything on the screen at once when we're trying to, you know, simplify. So there's, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Um, so, uh, going back to what you guys are saying about the free-to-play model, yes. uh, is that you mentioned that engagement uh, allows a better incentive to purchase or not to purchase. So, what do you think are the other uh, baby steps in terms of developing a free-to-play game that allows more engagement, other than what you just mentioned? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, we, we've experimented a lot. I think for, for us, uh, when a player plays Warframe and they love it, they love their Warframe. And we added a really robust cosmetic system into the game about a year into development. So we started with sort of just you know color palettes that you could change your color customization. And people loved that. And we realized, oh my goodness, they really want to customize the way they look. Free to play does this quite frequently. Maybe we should take a shot at it. And then we added um, what now I think is just kind of a pretty crazy customization system in Warframe. So just looking at you know looking to your peers for examples of what's done, what we what's fair because of course um, for us it's all about fairness. And we've gone as far as to add in-game currency trading. So what you pay for on the currency side of things, you can actually trade for a free player. So everything truly can be earned in game if you have the the trade economy to support it. Yeah, I think on my end, I would also add that just you know, make sure play, players are having a good time and they have a reason to enjoy coming back every day. And as I mentioned before, like everything good comes from that fact. And that's, that's really, you know, you got to start there, in my opinion. Uh, make sure that players are having a good time and you'll see the benefits of that uh, in many ways. Okay, thanks for your opinion, guys. Thank you. Howdy. Hi, thanks for a really interesting talk. I just had a question. When you were iterating on, iterating on the solar map, I was wondering if you uh, had members of the community come in and, uh, and try and use it, and if so, what you learned from that process. We, we didn't have anyone come in from the community for that no. segment. I think. And that's uh, where we failed, yeah. I think, to be honest. Like in, yeah. Are you talking about the, 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 the rings. console one? Yeah, yeah. yeah and that's, that's honestly where a lot of our failure came from, is that we, we didn't do our due diligence there, and we certainly paid the price. Like it, it worked. It was functional. So you know, it, it was just a flavor thing, and then an ultimate thing that we had to completely change. Well, I actually asked because I was actually one of those players that joined when you launched on PS4. Oh, and, oh fantastic. Uh, and Thank you. And I just had some feedback. I found the text too difficult to read because it was so small uh, yes. from sitting in front of a television. And uh, just going forward, it might be something you consider is bringing people into the studio to play the game prior to release, just because prior to the updates, just because you'll find a lot of those sort of things that uh, people might not comment on in the forums, but definitely uh, 
affect the player experience? We, we did start a private test cluster very soon after that to never make that mistake again. So while the tile solar map didn't get um, focus tested, we now have something set up. So we learned very dramatically from that uh, particular experience to try and set something up for that. So uh, yeah, if you want to talk after, I can give you details on that. Cool. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank you.